and this is one of the benefits of our infl inflammatory cycle. When we get any damage to a tissue, it increase, increases these secretion of these prostaglandins and kinins and such. These are chemicals, right? Inflammatory chemicals. That's going to attract phagocytes to the area. So you don't want to kill inflammation too fast because now you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? You're only getting half of the second line of defense, right? If you kill the inflammatory cycle too fast, let it ride for a day or so, right? Let the phagocytes come to the area, start cleaning up. That's what's necessary. So these are just the steps, and we can see it in the picture here. It can adhere to the phagocyte. Let's just say a certain uh, bacteria here, which is represented by this, is too slippery, and it somehow can't get a hold of it, right? Do I remember seeing this in the book? What can, that, what can we do in that case if we can't find a, a handle on it? We can secrete what's called opsonins, which are tiny, another protein, right? As if we need another protein. Tiny little proteins that we can stick to the bacteria as like little handles, right? So once we secrete these opsonins, that will stick to the bacteria, and now we can hold on to those opsonins to carry them. So it's like Spider-Man, you know, putting out a web, something like that. Anyway, we bring it in. This is called endocytosis. Once we bring it in, it's always going to be put in a small vesicle. Then we attach it with a lysosome, and what happens? We digest it and spit out the waste, right? That's our specific phagocytic activity. If we wanted to take this idea and think of it as an antigen-presenting cell, right? Right now, it's not an antigen-presenting cell. Right now, it just ate it up and spit it out. But if it were an antigen-presenting cell, it would do the same kind of thing. It would bring it in, digest it, but it wouldn't just spit everything out. It would take one of these little pieces and embed it in the cell membrane. And that would be our marker. So if this were an antigen-presenting cell and it encountered an antigen somewhere, brought it in, ate it up, broke it up, and then put a little fragment on the cell membrane, what would it bind to at that point? If this were an APC, it would bind to a, a T helper cell. Beautiful. And the T helper would recognize that little fragment and the class two protein on the cell membrane of the ABC, APC, sorry, and then start proliferating a big B cell attack. So that's what we'll see in the videos to come. And this is just picture by picture. But really, as, as big as this story is, if you can get the drift that um, we're talking about the same darn concept over and over again, we're talking about lymphocytes or macrophages, either one, B cells or macrophages, either one, finding some kind of antigen, binding to it, bringing it in, digesting it, and then putting a, a fragment of what it digested on the cell surface. Can you all remember that little cycle? Because we're going to see it over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, any time a uh, protein is produced in any cell, it has the automatic ability to kind of, remember we talked about window shopping? Mm -hmm. To show what kind of proteins that cell makes on its cell surface so that other cells can identify what that cell's been up to, right? It's like looking, peeking into the cell through the cell membrane. That's what all this is going to do. So immunity is based on the same thing. Okay, these complements were just um, another type. They act as though they attach to antigens or bacteria, and they punch holes in it. We're going to see more of this when we get to the B cell. Complements, they act independently. They're small proteins that are just locally uh, used in the tissues, and they'll act along with the whole B cell humoral immunity. So I'm skipping it for now, but we're going to come back to complements later. Just know that it's both innate and specific, and it mentions that right here. They're both nonspecific and specific. This is another one of our tools in our toolbox that even before we get to the B cells, these complements can be let out in the blood and can bind to pathogens, punch holes in their cell membrane, and what do they do? 
it, pu it pushes water inside that cell and causes them to lice. So this is what complements can do. So a couple of small things that we mentioned just to sum up. We mentioned in another day, we mentioned interferons, right? Where a virus infected cell, remember this? Once it noticed that it's been infected, can release these interferons, which are small chemicals that will be released around itself to let other healthy cells know that this one's been infected. So it gives those other healthy cells the ability to prepare themselves against that virus, right? In the process, the original infected cell will die, now, but now it's passed on its education to the neighboring healthy cells, warning it that it's been infected so that it can prep up. And it warns it with a good antiviral um, um, substance that can kill off the virus or at least uh, sequester it. A little bit. Same kind of idea, yeah. yeah. Then we have opsonins. What did opsonins do? Opsonins with little holders, right? Then we have complements that can use opsonins, of course. But complements are also things that punch holes in it. Okay. Now we know about our inflammation. We know about what inflammation does. We know fever. We secrete pyrogens when we have a fever, right? Again, another chemical that will attract more help to the area. Okay, now we're at the third line of defense. Our adaptive defense is noticed uh, or made, made unique by these three words. Specific, systemic, which means it's around the entire body, not just, let's say this. The innate immunity, let's say you get a cut, right? The innate immunity offers immunity where? Locally at the cut, right? Phagocytes come to that area. Inflammation is at that area. When we talk about adaptive defense, it's systemic. Even though the antigen comes in your mouth, right, or through a cut, the immunity is not just at that area, it's body-wide, right? The antibodies are spread not just there on the arm at the cut site, but the antibodies are spread where? All around the body. That's why they're humoral. They're in the body fluid. Okay. So we know it's specific, of course, which means that a specific antigen will, will be bound to a specific antibody, right? Like a lock and key kind of thing. And then it has memory, which means both B cells and T cells, whenever they're bound to an antigen, They'll always clone themselves, and half or not, about 80% of those clones become what's called effector cells, which actually do the, do the part in offering an immune response. And the other 20% are called memory cells, which kind of just tuck away and wait for a future exposure. Okay. So the more and more you hear it, hopefully it can stick. <laughs> Who knows? It's a lot to stick, I will be honest. All right, so antigens, what are they? They're also known as, I think, immunogens, which means they can start an immune response, right? And specifically, a complete antigen is one that will do a full response, including antibody production. It will cause those clonings of the B cells into the plasma cell, and then the plasma cell will secrete what? The antibodies, right? So over and over again, I'm going to be pointing over here because that's our standard method over there written on the board. B cells, when they're met with an antigen, will automatically start cloning themselves, right? Most of those clones will become plasma cells, which then secrete antibodies to circulate around the whole body. Other clones will become memory cells. Perfect. All right, now I think we got it. All right, so our complete antigens give us immunogenicity, which means they're able to stimulate or turn on uh, the lymphocytes and start antibody production. That's a given. And the reactivity just gives us the ability to react with antibodies. Um, those are all the types of complete antigens. I'll never, on a test, have you list that. I just want you to know the idea of what a complete antigen is, okay? I'm not going to start spitting out certain words. I think that's... That's kind of dumb, truthfully, to do that. 
we're not in a research class. I just want you to know what a complete antigen is. All right. Excuse the delay here. In the there we go. So we saw incomplete antigens are, can be called haptins. They're usually just irritants in the environment, right? They produce a response, but not necessarily a full antibody-produced response, right? There we go. So really, we're just uh, getting infl inflammation coming out of it and local, local problems. Well, it can be somewhat systemic as well, but it's usually more local. But the thing I didn't want to mention, but I'll have to, is that sometimes haptins can disguise themselves in other protein coats that make them look like a complete antigen. But we won't go there. We'll just mention it, but we won't go there. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah. Complete antigen will mount a full systemic response. Yes. A incomplete antigen won't. May or may not, may but it won't produce antibodies. Right. But there are certain cases where a haptin can disguise itself. It can bind to some other kind of protein that can make it look like a complete antigen. So I want to just put that out there because I know that's in the book. But it still won't produce antibodies. It, it will. It will. It will if it's bound to a specific kind of protein. But I'm not going to test on that. I'm not even going to go there because it's, I just want to make it more clean cut for you guys right now. Okay, so everybody standard? Everybody know the standard on Haptons? By themselves, they don't produce antibodies. Or they don't stimulate antibody production, I should say. Okay, so now we're back to um, what our antibodies will do. Notice, in this picture, antibodies are going to look, generally look like the, the letter Y. For some reason, that's just how they're shaped. Notice the end of them, right? These are differently shaped. And notice the antigen. The antigen itself is the bad, per, the bad guy, right? The foreign substance coming in the body. It can have certain antigenic determinants, which means small shapes on the edge of its cell surface, right? which will dictate which, which antibody it's going to bind to. So it's actually the antigen that picks the antibody, not the other way around. It's kind of strange if you think about it. The enemy the killer, huh? Yeah, it's very, very interesting like that. So in this case, in this example, this antigen has three different antigenic determinants, doesn't it? Three different shapes on it. So how many anti different antibodies can it bind to? Three. Three. So that's just trying to prove a point. Some antigens only have one antigenic determinant. So they will only find one specific antibody that they can bind to. Okay. And remember...